looks right, throws a deep pass, right side, end zone, hits caught, hits a touchdown. And the Cardinals continue to pour it on. Welcome to Cardinals Underground. Well, let's see. We've been keeping score at home, gentlemen. It's going to be my 17th season on the Cardinals sideline. And finally, I think I actually have something in common. Dare I say I can actually relate to an NFL head coach that when Cliff Kingsbury shares the worst part about the virtual Zoom meetings is when he thinks he has a killer joke and he delivers said joke and he thinks it's really funny only to be met with utter silence, dead silence, because either A, there's a delay, or B, everyone's on mute, or all of the above. And I said, you know what? Here on Cardinals Underground, especially in this multimedia platform edition, I can relate. How many times have I been met by the same dead silence I'm being met with right now? By we haven't been on mute, though, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the problem, Paul. Like, I feel like you did, you, you just dropped a joke that you didn't even know about, because are you sure you're going to be on the sideline for the 17th season? I mean, do we know that for sure? Oh, no. oh man. Yeah, you're right. It can't always get worse. You're absolutely right. What is the plan? Would that have been inappropriate and bad form if I would have just butted in with a self-serving question? Uh, Coach, I know this is the opening press conference, uh, a training camp, but is there going to be a sideline radio pencil neck this year? That, that would have been, yeah, that would have been great. I would have been axed out immediately from the forum. Well, the, the, the reality is, as we start getting closer to this, and, and as Cliff Kingsbury said, and as we're all finding out, this is all really fluid, and a lot can change, and a lot can change on a week-to-week -week basis. But where we stand right now, um, you know, I think the three of us are going to do what we can in terms of being insiders, but there is a very real possibility we will not be talking to any players in person this year. It'll, it'll all be virtual. Uh, and I know that having gone through um, some testing already uh, for my uh, level of, of getting back into the building and maybe doing a couple of things, it is, uh, it's a strange new world being at the facility, the little that I have been, uh, which has just really been for the testing and, and how it's all kind of sealed up and how many people that work for that organization outside of football, you know, I don't even know if they're going to be returning. Uh, you know, we'll have to see how all that goes and, and what they do. I mean, this is, this is really, as Cliff said, uncharted territory. It really is in a lot of ways. I mean, think about it, Kyle. You're the New England Patriots, and one day this week you wake up, and a few hours later you're missing your starting right tackle, your inside linebacker, your green dot guy, Patrick Chung, one of your longtime key pieces on defense. A half dozen players within about a half dozen hours all decide to opt out. And when Darren says fluid, he's not kidding, is he? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, that's huge losses right before the season starts, and you're going to have to figure things out on the fly. But I think that's going to be the name of the 2020 season is figuring things out on the fly. And hey, these guys, if they don't feel comfortable playing, I'm glad that they worked out a financial situation, especially for the high-risk guys, where they can get paid a pretty good amount and not feel pressured to play. I mean, the guys that have tens of millions of dollars can opt out easily, but there are still some guys earlier in their careers who have decent money, but not life-changing money quite yet. So the fact that if you're high-risk and you want to leave, they're going to give you money. And then voluntarily, if you just don't feel comfortable with playing, you have that option too. It, that, that has to be the way to go. We can't force people to play that don't feel comfortable about it. So it's nice, but from a, from a team and sport perspective, yeah, it's, it's going to change things quickly, the Patriots being the best example. Is that easy to explain, Kyle? If a player opts out, is there an automatic stipend or does that money come off a future contract? How does that work? Yeah. So it, you're either a high risk opt out or a voluntary opt out. And it, it goes back to if you have health conditions or certain things where you meet the criteria for high risk, and then you basically get $350,000 free and clear if you're a high risk. And if you're voluntary, it's $150,000 salary advance from next year's salary. So it's it's not really any money for the voluntary ones. It's just more of a, a loan for the season where you can have some money that you're going to have to pay back next year. But at least they have a situation where anybody that wants to out, opt out will have that cash flow and, and have some money during these tumultuous times. And Darren, we've seen one common thread, at least that I've seen, because there have been dozens of players so far, none at least by the Cardinals, based on what Cliff Kingsbury told the media earlier this week. But one common theme has just been family. 
either you have young fathers, you have newborns, you have certain family situations that go well beyond just the player, but thinking about the health and, and, and future of a family, and they're almost forced into a decision like that. You can't blame somebody who's wanting to do that. And I know there's a lot of fans out there, because I've already seen a lot of them, who have kind of pushed back on these guys that are not playing and saying, you know, I've got to go to work to support my family. It's ridiculous that these highly paid athletes are, are doing this. And yet I, I did see one, which I thought really crystallized it all. The guy's basically like, well, if I could do that, I would. I don't understand why they can't go to work. Well, that's the whole point. They can. There is a system set up so they can sit out if they don't feel comfortable or if they're trying to protect uh, a wife or a mother or a, a, a child. And, and I think that's important. And as you noted, you know, Cliff Kingsbury, as we're recording this, he did say that at this point, he has not yet heard from any Cardinals that want to do that. But the deadline is something like 10 days or whatever from the time that the NFLPA and the NFL put to paper exactly what the opt-out is. And they We've talked about it, and Kyle kind of went over those details, but it apparently hasn't been completely finalized. And until the, the signatures are, are signed on actual documents, uh, the deadline gets pushed. And right now, um, we're still talking about a week into August. So while Cliff Kingsbury might not have talked to anybody yet, there's still a very real possibility that there could be Cardinals that decide this isn't the right thing for them. Um, and again, it goes back to what we were saying before. Fluid, 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 fluid. If you are going into this thing and assuming that once we get to X day that it's all going to settle out and we're just going to have this normal season, it's ridiculous. Um, that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, we've seen it in baseball already. Um, there's going to be some tough times. And like Cliff was saying, you know, this is about everybody understanding there's going to be those tough times and dealing with it. And I kind of interpreted that as, you know, you, you – no fans, no teams, no players, no coaches should be sitting there going, well, you know, where is this is a competitive disadvantage. There's going to be competitive disadvantages everywhere. Again, talk to the Patriots who are losing all these players. I mean, if at one point somebody says, yeah, the Cardinals have to go play the Jets this year, uh, but you've got to fly in on an overnight and play a 4 p.m. kickoff in New York because there's no – uh, there's no stayovers and you're going to basically land on Sunday morning, go play the game and get right back on a plane. That possibly still could happen and you're just going to have to deal with it. That's interesting. That got my attention because, because you're right. Who knows where this is tracking? Look at baseball thought it was in one place and four or five games into a season. It's radically different. You, you have no idea where this is tracking exactly. And you know what? As far as a competitive disadvantage, yes, some teams are going to be hit harder than others, but some teams are hit hard by injuries some years for no apparent reason. You lose a bunch of guys in a training camp. You still, I think more than any other sport, football is accustomed, Kyle, to dealing with on just the unknown, just guys going down at any moment and losing a key player for a season. And, and in that regard, everyone's on a level playing field because you never know who's going to go down for the end of a season next. Yeah, that's true. Injuries have always impacted seasons, but cl clearly there's going to be more volatility with this season. And especially when you start talking about quarterbacks, I mean, that's when you really start getting into game altering type things. I mean, if, if one of the quarterbacks gets COVID-19 and can't play for six weeks or whatever, then that's going to severely impact their team. And, and, what do you do if multiple quarterbacks on your team get it or, or, or a, a half your position group gets it or something. So it's going to be a lot, a, a lot more than a normal season. If, you know, in a worst case scenario where this happens, but like you guys have been saying, we just have to expect the unexpected and, and see how it plays out. And Kyle, you asked Cliff Kingsbury about his plan potentially for the quarterbacks because other teams have already made decisions in that front, right? Yeah. And Pete Carroll, uh, told Peter King that he's going to keep Russell Wilson and Geno Smith separate from each other. Geno Smith being the backup in Seattle. And I, you know, you see pros and cons to that. Do you, do you want to have those guys split up during meetings and, and how does that work where Brett Hundley is not going to be in the meeting when Cliff and Kyler are talking? I mean, that's valuable in itself to have him in there. So maybe it's him looking virtually while somebody else is in person or something. Um, but clearly if you can maybe keep those two guys apart because 
quarterback is the position you need the most in the NFL. And obviously you want Kyler to be your guy, but if he's not, you don't want to be in a spot where you don't have your backup available. So I think caution in that position in particular is pretty important. Well, all I know is that Paul is actually hoping for an outbreak so that Chris Streveler can get a lot of snaps. I think that's how that's working out. I, I'm, I'm still depressed over missing that fourth and final preseason game, honestly. A, because I, like, I look forward to ripping Ron Wolfley on the TV call. Uh, and, then, and then B, because Strebler, the leveler, would have gotten an inordinate amount of snaps. And obviously, you know, that would have been a real showcase for the guy. So, um, but you, re- you see already that the Cardinals made a move at quarterback to get down to 80. And it wasn't Chris Strebler. It was Drew Anderson. So there, there you go, Darren. I mean, I'm just curious, is he truly only a quarterback? How much is he going to run some of these other positions, receiver in particular? Well, I mean, I talked to him earlier in the offseason for a story on azcardinals.com. And um, I asked him directly. I'm like, you know, everybody wants to talk about Taysom Hill and those possibilities and you know, have they talked to you about that? And he said at the time, now, again, this was a a while ago, but he said at the time, all their discussions were about him being a quarterback. They were signing him as a quarterback. He was being brought in as a quarterback. That was his number one position. Now he's willing to do whatever it takes to make the team special teams do whatever. Uh, And I do think he adds value if, if you have him around and if he can do some other things like Taysom Hill, it gives you this flexibility that even if you want to have him active on a game day, he can provide you as, as a, a backup quarterback type situation and do all these other things. So I do think there's going to be that involved, but he absolutely feels like they're going to look at him as a quarterback. And we'll have to see because even when he was playing quarterback in the CFL, um, he couldn't hold on to that job long term. His value was as this kind of Swiss Army knife. So uh, I'm curious to see what he does. But I mean, honestly, Paul, I'm curious to see almost everybody at this point. I'm curious to see Akeem Butler coming back from injury. I'm curious to see what Patrick Peterson looks like. I want to see Isaiah Simmons on the field. I mean, I I just, I'm praying that all these testing, all this testing goes well uh, and that they are able to get on the field uh, in early August, like they're supposed to, and, and we can actually see some football happen. By the way, the little bit I was told about his trial with the Cardinals, he can catch the ball. He can run and he can definitely catch the ball. They actually felt pretty solid about his skills as a receiver. And you know what? As far as he knows, the mustache here, I think, is a shout out to the CFL. I've just made that decision. I called that audible right now. Um, can, can we see you in the cowboy hat and the no shirt and the fur coat like <laughs> Strebler did during the Winnipeg uh, parade? That I can't pull off. The man's got to know his limitations. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's not get absurd around here. Okay. Um, by the way, speaking of striking a look, uh, Cliff Kingsbury, I think, this is my segue to something you said, Darren, about Isaiah Simmons. I think he read everyone's mind. When we saw the video of Isaiah Simmons just walking down the ramp into the Cardinals facility to sign his deal, as Cliff Kingsbury said, man, he looks pretty when he's out there. I mean, he is just a specimen. If nothing else, he's part of the all-travel team, isn't he, Kyle? I, I mean, if you have to look forward to anyone when we finally get out there, whenever that is in mid-August, all eyes are going to be on Isaiah Simmons. Yeah, I mean, he's obviously one of the the big ticket newcomers. I mean, on offense, you'll have DeAndre Hopkins. People will be watching him. Um, But Isaiah Simmons, not just because he's this high pick, but how are you going to deploy him? And does does such a truncated training camp mean that you can't do as much as you wanted to with him? Or or can you still move it around and, and keep those packages small? enough for him to make an impact at outside linebacker or or safety. So, yeah, I mean, people want to see how he plays first and foremost and how, what kind of movement skills he has. And we'll be able to see the athleticism pretty quickly, but then it it really transfers to, okay, this guy does look the part. And if so, then how do we start deploying him? Is that a position battle, Darren Urban? I put it to you. How many position battles are there right now? And is Devondre Campbell, Isaiah Simmons, one of those? That's a fantastic question. I actually asked Cliff about position battles and camp battles, knowing that, um, you know, you're going to have fewer padded practices than you ever do uh, before a regular season starts, and you're not going to have any preseason games. And you didn't see anything in the offseason. I mean, that's a, that's a trifecta that just would seem to undercut camp battles all over the place. I would think the one place you might have one potentially would be the Simmons-Campbell thing. But again, you spend, you're spending a lot of money on Devondre Campbell this year. 
Uh, Isaiah Simmons has never done anything NFL related yet. Uh, I think you don't want to crush his soul by putting too much on him early. And I think the whole idea of having veterans in there so that you can bring along a rookie perhaps a little more slowly than if you wanted to anyways, and that's not even thinking about a pandemic situation, uh, I think is ideal. So I think ultimately it's going to be a tough road to hoe for Isaiah Simmons to get into the starting lineup, at least in the base. I could be totally wrong. Maybe he wows them completely once they get on the field, but I just, I feel like all signs point to seeing some Devondre Campbell early uh, coaches, coaches tend to like veteran players anyways. And in this situation, I would think they'd really like them. So that's kind of how I see it. And the, and the, across the rest of the field, I mean, you know, it sounds like Marcus Gilbert's already the, the potential right tackle if he's healthy. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of wherever, where else there might be some kind of competition. Uh, and Kyle, you can bail me out, but I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head where like, hey, I don't know if this guy would necessarily start. No, I think it seems very, very much like we have most of our starters, which is rare. I mean, there's most seasons where you're looking at two or three spots where there's a legit competition. And going back last year, A.Q. Shipley versus Mason Cole was a big one and what you were going to do at cornerback. And we'll see. I mean, it only takes an, an injury or, you know, bad case, a, a COVID-19 test to really flip everything on its head and, and you have to deal with filling in spots. But when you look at it on paper right now, I, I don't feel like there are a lot, especially if, if Marcus Gilbert grabs that one. And I just feel like with Simmons, I think they're, they're going to get him on the field. I think him, Devondre Campbell, and Jordan Hicks, they can kind of Great. rotate in together because they have different strengths. So maybe that's not technically a battle because Campbell will start, but I think there's enough snaps for all three of those guys. I mean, I want to cite the Jalen Thompson safety position, but I can't really give you a viable challenger right now. Was Perhaps there's say. a time time sign, right? I mean, I, I want to say Lamont Gilliard gives Mason Cole a run, perhaps at center, but but now I'm reaching. You know, I mean, honestly, there's just there aren't that many viable position battles right now. Uh, you know, right tackles you mentioned Marcus Gilbert, uh, but what about Kelvin Beecham? I, I mean, here's a guy who started a lot of games. Do you think he's going to be given an opportunity, Darren, to challenge? I just I think if we would have been in a different situation, had there been an off season where guys could have flashed a little bit, had we been able to use that as some momentum going into camp, camp would have been normal. You would have had preseason games where guys could do some things. I think, yeah, I think there probably could have been some possibilities uh, camp out. If nothing else, like you mentioned Jalen Thompson, who I think flashed last year and did a good job, but Maybe you see him in the offseason and he's not progressing quite how you'd like. And then all of a sudden you're signing somebody right before camp to, to battle for that. You, you don't have that. You didn't have that happen this summer. You didn't have anybody. We always talk about flashing in the offseason. There's also times when guys get to the offseason and they disappoint in the OTAs. And all of a sudden teams completely rethink how they want to go into training camp because a guy wasn't taking it seriously enough. Or and we know we, there's been examples of that where they're not taking it seriously enough or they just underperformed or whatever it was. And you're like, oh, we were counting on this guy. And now all of a sudden, I'm not so sure. Now we've got to create something in training camp. Um, there, there just wasn't that. And the problem is, is you're not going to, I mean, if they're not getting on the field until mid-August and they're having a maximum of whatever it was, 16 padded practices, I mean, that's that's not a whole lot of time to evaluate. I mean, you're going to want to get through a couple of weeks before you might say this guy's really impressing me or on the flip side, this guy is really disappointing me. And by that time, you're about to run smack dab into a regular season week of practice. And as Cliff Kingsbury revealed to the media, it's still going to be a mix, even during Cardinals camp, of virtual and in-person meetings, for example. Some days will be virtual, some days they'll be using – the expanses of the stadium and having guys socially distance and there'll be meetings that way. I mean, Kyle, just because card camp starts, it doesn't mean that, and maybe this is my presumption, but I just thought, okay, boom, once everyone tests and everyone's cleared and cards camp begins at that point, it's going to be pretty traditional. And based on what Cliff Kingsbury told the media and wait a minute, hit the brakes, not so much. Yeah, and I think there's certain scenarios, especially when you get on the field where obviously they're going to make contact and those are 
parts of the job when you're practicing, but when you're off the field and you're doing meetings, I think it makes a ton of sense to just exercise an abundance of caution and try to keep people separated because yeah, maybe everybody tested in the morning and nobody tested positive. So we think everybody's fine, but if there was an inaccurate test or somehow somebody got it after the test, I mean, it, you just have to bring your mind to worst case scenario. And if everybody's in a group, you saw what happened with the Marlins, it can transfer quickly. So I think any, any situation where you can social distance and can do things virtually, it's just smarter to do things that way. I, I know Paul that, you know, they're going through all these protocols and it's important to do all these things. Um, but the reality is, is, you know, even staying at the, uh, at, at training camp, normally they all stay at a hotel. Well, part of the collective bargaining uh, adjustments that were had was some of these guys are allowed to not stay at the hotel. So now you're, you're going to have that part of it. You can go through all the testing, all the people at the facility are going to go through the testing that are around the players, but the players go home to people that, aren't being tested and you don't know what's going to happen. I thought one of the things that was uh, great for Cliff Kingsbury to say, and it's, it's obvious, but it's always good to have, hear it from somebody like Cliff Kingsbury and I'm paraphrasing, but he, he basically said, look, all these protocols are in place not to prevent positive tests. There are going to be positive tests. What we're going to try and do is mitigate things and respond to them once we have positive tests, because there will not be a situation where a team's going to be able to get through and nobody being positive. It's not going to happen. Guys are going to test positive. It just is. And, and then you, where you go from there is what teams and the league are going to have to deal with. And if nothing else, what everyone in pro sports should have learned from the Marlins situation was that, you know what, what you do away from the park matters. That what you do away from practice and away from the team is even more important than what you're doing when you're around your teammates, because at least that's safe territory, at least you presume. So perhaps it took that, but that's going to resonate through the rest of professional sports and might be beneficial in that aspect. We'll see about that. Here's what I wonder, Kyle, and somebody hinted it, maybe, maybe it was coach who brought it up himself, but do the Cardinals have a little bit of a competitive advantage, a little bit, by the fact that Cliff Kingsbury is most recently a college head coach and is very much accustomed to getting ready for a regular season game, boom, with no preseason game at his disposal. Yeah, it can't hurt. Like you said, I'm not sure how much it's, it's this huge competitive advantage, but he does understand the lead up to a season where you're just getting going. Uh, you look at coaches that are in the NFL, it's not going to completely throw them off that they don't have the exhibition slate, but knowing that how he structured his, his ramp up activities and understanding, I mean, you want your players to be peaking in week one and then moving on from that. So he has an understanding going back to his memory bank of, of what to do as far as getting guys physically ready and mentally ready. And yeah, maybe it will uh, pay off the slightest bit that he understands how to do it without preseason games. So we're on the big red rage, right? Thursday, six o'clock, 98, seven FM, Arizona sports. And our special guest was the voice of the Cardinals, Dave Pash. And he brought up the following premise, Darren, actually it's his opinion that the Cardinals will have an advantage in the fact that Cliff Kingsbury and Kyler Murray don't have to worry about some sort of fake faux offense, some sort of vanilla offense that they're going to waste time to some degree practicing or installing during the preseason, and that everything they do during Cardinals camp, which to my understanding is going to be closed, right? There will be no fans in there whatsoever. You don't have to worry about some rogue cell phone getting video out or something you're working on or what have you. It is going to be an absolute regular season setting where you can be rest assured of doing whatever you want in complete stealth superstitious fashion. And boom, you can just work on regular season stuff from the get go, which will make you that much more regular season ready. So I, I, I am a Dave Pash fan, TV's own Dave Pash. Um, and I appreciate his opinion, but you are, everything you just said was correct. I'm not sure how that gives you an advantage when every single team in the league is getting that same advantage. Um, there is, the, the practices being closed for the Cardinals is a league-wide thing. Um, now, teams, I, I don't know if teams are allowed to adjust it, but basically the league went in and, and, and it had said that, uh, from what I have seen, 
that while practices can be seen by media, um, there's going to be no reporting that's allowed, in, allowed to be going on about it, like you mentioned. I mean, you can mention, like, let's say DeAndre Hopkins caught a 70-yard touchdown bomb from Kyler Murray, but we can't talk about, like, if Isaiah Simmons spent a few plays at slot cornerback in one thing, you can't, you're, you're not supposed to say that stuff. And so I agree that you can kind of go uh, restrictor plates off in terms of if you're putting stuff in, you can do whatever you want because it won't get out to the outside world. But if every team is doing that, I don't know how much of an advantage well, you're really getting out of it. Maybe I should have set it up by saying that there's just an understanding that Cliff Kingsbury is very innovative and creative and has wow. spent a lot of time looking at a lot of different levels of college football and really creating a you know some wrinkles in the playbook plus did, didn't we do that last year paul didn't we have this discussion last year and but also and so, the, po the possibilities and potential and ceiling of a kyler murray and what he's able to do come for the arms stay for the legs you know our marketing mantra right as opposed to a more traditional quarterback where how creative can you get with, with a pocket quarterback per se and, and you're right we spent a lot of time <laughs> talking about how matt patricia was in trouble <laughs> oh, boy, he needed two pencils in each ear to get ready for the Cardinals in week one. And what did the Cardinals do in the first half of that game against the Lions? Probably the worst half of offensive football all season long, uh, other than the Rams home game, right, coming off the bye. <laughs> As you nod, Kyle, you know. So, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of conjecture by us media guys. But I, I, you can't tell me there won't be that much more efficient. For everybody who thinks that, oh, September is going to be horrendous football because of no preseason, well, there's going to be a lot of time you don't waste just doing vanilla stuff as well that maybe lets you be that much sharper come week one. See, I, I do feel like the way Cliff was talking at the end of last season before any coronavirus was in our mind, he, I think he was going to run his training camp and just not worry about the fans and just do the things he had to do to get ready and run his, his base offense and get it ready and, and even add a, a few wrinkles. So I don't think... I think he learned his lesson from trying to hide too much and his team wasn't prepared. And I think that was going to change. The one part I do agree with you is if you have two or three gadget plays you want to institute per week, I think you can do those in camp because there aren't, isn't anybody watching and you can dial down on some Chris Trevler specials or some different type of fun things that you want to do <laughs> wide receiver. I mean, we saw a lot of wide Getting receiver passes last year. Riled up here. <laughs> yeah. So you have more time to do that, but I, I don't think that, I don't think he was going to do too much of that. Cause I think overall it was a net negative last year where he, he just hid too much stuff and the team wasn't ready. So I, I think he's, he would much rather just get the offense in, make sure everybody's on the same page. And if people see it, they see it. It's not going to happen this year without fans, but I don't think that's on his worries list anymore. I tell you what, I might have my Twitter account suspended because if there's a spectacular slubber, the leveler type of play that they create, I might have to tweet about it and just violate all the rules and they'll suspend my social media account for, for a little <laughs> while. But it might be worth it. I'll take one for the team, perhaps. Yeah, we'll no learn, reporting we'll unless it's on Chris with, Strebler. <laughs> uh, you'll, you can have that discussion with Mark Dalton. I'd love, we can watch that happen. Yeah. And second thought, that maybe it's not worth it. Um, by the way, uh, Coach did tell us, Darren, that they've already had some walkthroughs with the rookies. So I was not aware of that. Maybe they're a little farther now down that learning curve than perhaps we had anticipated. But um, I know the coaches maybe feel a little better about it because Cliff Kingsbury had that crack in the offseason. Yeah, they nod on the Zoom meetings, but you never know until you actually get them out on the gridiron. Well, let's, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. I mean, we, you know, if anybody was looking at, at uh, social media and azcardinals.com over the weekend, we saw the, the rookies getting in there for really the first time. The draft picks were able to sign their contracts. So, I mean, the, the amount of time that they spent in walkthroughs has just started because they had to get through those tests. And, uh, you know, one hour worth of walkthroughs uh, with essentially just rookies is, is a vastly different than what's ultimately going to happen. But it's nice that they're getting a little bit of run up time before the veterans get in there and, and they'll have – a, little, a week or so uh, before I think they get meshed together. And again, they've been going through meetings with their teammates already all off season. Um, you know, how much they'll hopefully be able to do a little bit of bonding. Uh, part of I'm curious about how this all goes with the rookies is, you know, all these strength conditioning 
uh, situations are going to be done in smaller groups. And I'm, I'm curious to know how they break those up. I mean, to me, I would think about breaking them up uh, beyond like rookies. I wouldn't want just rookies, you know, in the strength and conditioning part of it, at least. And I know normally that's how they would do it. But in this certain circumstance, it'd be kind of nice if you, you know, made sure positions were together or you, you got some veterans with some rookies. So there was some kind of like intermingling rather than keeping all the rookies together for a longer period of time. That's just me. You know, I put myself in the place of the coaches right now and, and still the unknown with the rookies. You know, for everything we dismiss about the off season, the OTAs, the mini camps, et cetera, there have been a lot of cases where we've already known whether a rookie can play or not before you enter training camp. Tyron Matthew, you knew the first week that during rookie minicamp, hey man, this guy might run a four or five, but he plays like he runs a four three. The anticipation, the playmaking, a David Johnson who, who wowed in camp. Yeah, he had a hamstring injury early in camp, but I, I can tell you by the third preseason game when he's finally eligible to play, players were shoving me out of the way getting off the bench to watch 31 because they wanted to see him when he finally got reps in the game. Players, no John players. They, you know, I love DJ Humphreys, but they knew right away. Yeah. He wasn't ready his rookie year. They, they were not going to be able to count on him. So, you know, I find that intriguing, Kyle, that guys can sit in those meetings. They can go through the walkthroughs of Darren's point, but they still don't know who can play, who's an NFL player, who can they count on. And in a lot of cases, they already had a really strong inkling based on the offseason stuff. Yeah, I think a good thing for the Cardinals, you look at the roster composition, and we talked about Isaiah Simmons trying to be in this position battle, but they've already got Devondre Campbell, a solid veteran player at inside linebacker. And beyond Simmons, none of these rookies are pegged to have these large roles in, in 2020. So if they impress, great. And then they're going to be on the field, and that just adds to the roster and adds to the talent. But if it does take those guys longer, then you – Steve Kime did a good job of filling all of the, the holes on the roster and you don't see anything glaring right now where you need a Josh Jones to come in and play right away or you need Isaiah Simmons to be this every down linebacker. And I, I think with, with Simmons, it reminds me of Buda Baker where he didn't play in the offseason because Washington was on the quarters academic system. But he came in in camp and right away it's like, okay, Buddha is a playmaker. And this guy, it, it took him a little time to get on the field, but you could tell he was an NFL player right away. And if Simmons shows that like Buddha Baker did, then you're going to know, okay, we can use Isaiah Simmons right away in certain packages. And then we're just going to grow his role as the season moves along. And then last year, to a certain degree, I won't put him on the same level as Buddha, but Jalen Thompson, a supplemental pick, didn't even get picked until July. And then just came in, Darren. And so he did last year basically what every rookie is going to be tasked with doing this year in Cardinals camp. Well, that's also true. And, and it has been proven, and I agree with both of you guys. I mean, Jalen Thompson showed some things. Obviously, it's happened in the past. The difference with Isaiah Simmons really is that Jalen Thompson – now, at the time last year, you know, people, we all thought DJ Swearinger was going to be that guy and Jalen Thompson was going to have to do anything. And obviously that didn't work out at all. Uh, fortunately, Jalen Thompson was able to step up. You know, you, you've got to have some – I would – I'm having some confidence in Devondre Campbell to a certain extent, whereas I, I don't know if there's going to be – it's more like a Buddha with Tyron Matthews situation where it's like, okay, I, I think we're going to see a lot from Isaiah Simmons in camp in terms of knowing he's a player, and I think we know that anyways. I just don't know how much they're going to have to lean on him early. And I agree with Kyle. They're going to find places to play him. I think you absolutely, and I think we've talked about this in the in the in previous undergrounds. I mean, am I going to be shocked if there are some packages where Isaiah Simmons and Devondre Campbell and Jordan Hicks are all on the field together? I wouldn't be. I mean, that makes a lot of sense if you do it the right way. So I, I think there's snaps for all of them. I just think that, you know, potentially in the future, especially knowing Devondre Campbell is essentially on a one-year deal um, and you have Isaiah Simmons now, I think it's going to be down the road is where you're really going to see Isaiah Simmons as the snap eater as opposed to this year. And look, no one has more respect for regular season NFL football and the jump from the college game. But you are talking about a guy who got more than 100 snaps at five different positions last year for Clemson. So if there's one guy who hopefully can master one position on an abbreviated offseason and the coaches can actually get to the point where they trust him, 
hopefully, presumably, that would be in Isaiah Simmons. And, uh, and you're right, Darren. I fully expect there's got to be at least third down packages, passing situations where he's going to be installed as that X factor, regardless if it's off the edge, maybe a trail blitzer, some sort of, you know, they put him in as that, as that nickel safety. And, 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 you know, you have no idea. By the way, real quick, speaking of that safety spot and playmaker, what'd you guys make of the Seahawks trading for Jamal Adams? Because that's one of those huge trades, Kyle, that we, we even though this is Cardinals underground, we got to zoom out, look over the block wall into our neighbor's backyard and the Seahawks and what they're attempting to do now with Jamal Adams. I, well, I have a feeling I'm going to know what Kyle's going to say, but I'll, I want to listen to him say, because I could be wrong, but I, I have a feeling I know where he's going to go. Go ahead and guess no, beforehand. I, let, let me, let me, are you going to, is it going to be something like you think Jamal Adams is a really good player, but you, they gave up too much because he's a safety and it's not a premium position? <laughs> Pretty much. No, it, <laughs> I don't think it has anything to do with his position in this situation. And I do think it's good for 2020 and the Seahawks, but yeah, I, I think they gave up a premium, two first round picks. And the fact that you have to pay him in two years, his market value, I, I was surprised at what the Jets got back and the Seahawks are going for it and they got an all pro safety and that's going to help them in the short term. But I think they damaged themselves long term. I was and that's, and I, honestly, Paul, all I could think about when it happened was, OK, yeah, they got a little bit better, especially in the short term. We'll see how it all plays out. But the other thing was what Kyle tweeted about right after, which is DeAndre Hopkins for a second round pick. <laughs> And a running back with all, and I love David Johnson as a person, a running back they didn't want him. It, no, it is. It's staggering. That's why we gave him the Rex Ryan Award for winning the offseason. Right there. We didn't care what the Buccaneers did afterwards with Brady and Grant. Didn't matter. It was we already handed out the hardware and deservedly, rightfully so. Cardinals win the offseason. Boom. I was shocked though what the Jets got. You figured they were dealing from such a compromised position after Jamal Adams went scorched earth with the comments about Adam Gase and everything else that I never in a million years thought they would still get two first round picks, a third and a player out of that whole situation. However, I will say he may not play a premium position, but he's a premium player and yeah. they need that sort of playmaker, a guy capable of playing in the box and stopping the run and going after the quarterback his numbers stop in the run. His numbers, uh, you know, pass rushing as a safety are some of the best for that position in the league. And you're talking about a team, a defense, and Seattle's defense that finished bottom, the bottom three teams in virtually every pass rushing stat there is, and they still don't have JV and Clowney back. I was going to say, Paul, I mean, unless they're going to line them up at edge rusher, they still have a big uh, problem at, at what I feel like is the most important part of your defense. If they, you can't rush the passer – uh, you know, unless they're going to blitz him all the time. I, I think Jamal Adams is a fantastic player, and I do think he can help that team. And it does feel like they're trying really hard to uh, create Legion of Boom, the sequel. Um, although they got hurt when Quentin Dunbar uh, perhaps allegedly robbed some people. Um, so that's going to hurt them. But, I mean, ultimately, if they can't get any pressure on the quarterback, I mean, what, what is that? What, what are they really going to be able to do about it? And I, I do feel like that's, that's a, big, a big problem for them. Now, that all being said, I saw somebody who, who wanted to argue the other day that the Seahawks have the best roster overall in the NFL. So, who knows? I think this is a good opportunity, too, for the Cardinals to look at Jamal Adams and realize if Isaiah Simmons turns into this guy, we're in really good shape. I think it's, I think it's a good comp for Isaiah Simmons, what Jamal Adams can do in coverage, rushing uh, against the run. I mean, that's, that's the guy that you want Isaiah Simmons to turn into. And it's a big leap, even though Isaiah Simmons has all this talent, Jamal Adams has proven himself in the NFL, but mm -hmm. it just, it's just, uh, that's the reminder is that, if Isaiah Simmons becomes this, the Cardinals have him on a really small contract, whereas Jamal Adams in two years is going to be getting $16 million a year. Yeah, it's going to be, I mean, that's, that's the, the thing about having to pay that contract. I mean, you know, that's why the Hopkins thing worked out so well for the Cardinals, because even if they want to give him a boost a little bit, they already knew he was making a lot of money and you, you, you didn't give up as much. And that's, that's what I, I really I, I don't understand. It's funny you mentioned Clowney a little earlier, Paul, because he's still on the market as we record this. And um, I, I saw an interview with the Titans and Mike Vrabel, uh, and he was like, 
I think Clowney might meet with the Titans doctors to kind of see if he's healthy. But the, the vibe that I've seen from reporters is that a lot of teams are ty- have tired of Jadavian Clowney looking for all this money when he's not going to get it and acting like he should. And I, I have to wonder a little bit if there's any way he ends up landing back in Seattle on another one-year deal just because that, you know, he, he has to. And that would change some things too. And most of the media has had the Titans as the likely landing spot just because of that relationship between Vrabel and, and J.D. Avey and Clowney going back to their Houston Texan days. And But you're right, it's not exactly tracking in that direction right now. I'd love to know how much the Cardinals, with that beatdown in Week 16 at Seattle, how much that factored into John Schneider, the GM, pulling the trigger on that deal, thinking, man – Cardinals came up here and ran 40 times for 253 yards. Chandler Jones had four sacks in a single game. Jadavion Clowney had three sacks the entire season. We got to do something to fortify this defense. I'm pulling the trigger on Jamal Adams. For me, the first thing I thought of is everybody's trying to get somebody to cover George Kittle in this division. That's the first thing I thought of. Or, or, Or maybe a spy on Kyler Murray as well as Jamal Adams. Now, Bobby Wagner can still run, but... You know, Jamal Adams is a guy, obviously, who can, uh, you know, have, have Kyler Murray with his head on a swivel as he's running for the sticks on third and nine. And I don't, I don't think it's, like, very short-term like that or looking at one player or one game. I just feel like the, the Seahawks feel like Russell Wilson is a top-two quarterback in the NFL, and we, are, we feel like we're in contention. Let's add a superstar to the mix. I, I also want to throw in, Paul, that, uh, the Seahawks have been pretty like they, they like trading down from their late in the first round picks a lot of times. And frankly, for all the grief that uh, uh, Steve Kime has gotten over his first round picks, uh, the current regime in Seattle has been pretty lousy with a lot of them. And uh, so maybe they just feel like it's just not important because we're probably not going to hit on them anyways. I, I ended up in a radio promo on a Seattle sports radio station for my take a year or two ago on go back and look at the recent draft classes ever since they hit those massive home runs, the likes of Cam Chancellor in the fifth round and then Richard Sherman in round three. Five. And obviously round Russell, five for Richard Five, Sherman. Russell Wilson in round three. I mean, they had some unbelievable drafts, obviously 2012, yeah. 2013, right in that era. But the last five to seven years, Wow. I mean, it's, there, there's been a paucity of picks, if you will, playmakers that have come out of Seattle's drafts, and they've struggled a lot on the offensive line, obviously. They're hitting, you know, it's been 52-card pickup. They're hitting the reset button again. So for all the talent that they have and all those – see, to me, the takeaway on Seattle's season last year was they played 11 single-score games, and they won nine of them. They went nine and two in those games. That's where the Arizona Cardinals have to get to. That's where the Cardinals – and Kyler Murray, that's the next step. For everything we judge, and okay, and, and the metrics and the stats and passing versus running and all these other Taking things. Taking a shot at you, Kyle. I, you I know, thought I was going to agree with you here, and now you just veered off track. It's still, <laughs> ultimately, all those numbers and stats and metrics and analytics are trumped by that win-loss record in single-score games. I mean, you, that's what the NFL is, Kyle. You're right, but – it doesn't mean anything going doing that well in one score games is not a testament to your talent. It's more luck. So what you want to do is win a lot of games in blowout fashion. And so your point differential is really good. And then you can stomach it if you have bad luck and you finish three and five in close games, because if you went, you know, seven and one in the other ones, Hey, you still won 10 games. So that's why, I don't think the Seahawks are as good as they showed because they won a lot of close games, which is just random. So close. The the coming together of you two was so close. And then I'm going to personally send that clip to that Seattle sports radio station and let them know that Russell Wilson's win loss record in one score games is luck. And I'm going to, I'm going to send them. I'm going to put Kyle Odegaard right on that sound clip. You're going to end up getting taking the wrath for those guys over the next coming season. I'll send you all the research along with it. (laughs) That's good. The facts. Um, um, <laughs> okay. You know what? Speaking of quarterbacks, all right, let's, let's, let's bag on someone else. Uh, back to Pash for a minute. No. <laughs> okay, we can do that. I, actually, I thought Dave made another salient point on the Big Red Rage. It's quite honestly Ron Wolfley underwhelmed. 
<laughs> that's, uh, we'll see if Wolf's listening. To... Anyway, Wolf accused me of underwhelming, so I, there's, there, I'm coming right back at him. Anyway, Ash made a comment that Cliff Kingsbury does not get enough credit as a developer of QB talent, as being a QB guru, whether it's Johnny Manziel winning the Heisman, whether obviously it's now Patrick Mahomes, the highest paid and, and best, most glorified quarterback on the planet, whether it's Kyler Murray, his rookie year, all 16 starts and winning offensive rookie of the year, that in Pash's opinion, uh, you've got a head coach who's going to become known as this developer of QB talent. He should now, but most definitely will in the future. I mean, I think that's pretty fair. He's got a nice lineup of guys and, and, he, and he had brought them through. I mean, I think if you're Cliff Kingsbury, I think if you wouldn't ask Cliff right now, while he would appreciate something like that, I think he'd rather be known as a winning NFL head coach. Uh, because when you start saying, well, he's a great developer of quarterbacks and he's already head coach and he's not winning games, that almost can end up being a backhanded compliment, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, so I think, I think for what Cliff is doing now, he's got to be more than just a QB developer. Now, if we're just talking in that narrow perspective, I don't think you're wrong um, in terms of bringing those guys out. But I think even Cliff would say, look, um, Pat Patrick Mahomes was going to be a great quarterback, just depending on who he was being coached by. Kyler Murray was already a great quarterback before I ever got to coach him. I just am coaching him on this level. Um, that's partly because Cliff is modest and partly because he's got the right talent. I mean, Adam Gase has gotten whatever he's gotten, two or three head coaching jobs uh, because he spent a minute with Peyton Manning. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's like coaching is important. Don't get me wrong. Coaching is important, but you better have the talent to build off of. You can't be a quarterback developer if, and I can say this because he took a jab at himself on, on a Facebook post of mine recently. If you got John Skelton, I don't care if you're Cliff Kingsbury, you're probably not developing a, a super awesome NFL quarterback. I love you, John, but you, you know where that goes. Or if you got Ryan Lindley, I mean, you, you got to have a guy with talent in the first place. I was going to say, at the very least, he's an elite QB evaluator because yeah. he went after Patrick Mahomes. He, he got Baker Mayfield uh, to college with him at Texas Tech, and we saw what he became as a, as a former walk-on. And he was adamant that the Cardinals should draft Kyler Murray, even though they had Josh Rosen, which you could have easily just not taken Kyler Murray if you had questions about, you know, his height or, or anything else, his inexperience. So he's an elite evaluator, and I think clearly that he knows how to develop those guys. And I agree that you're going to have to win in the NFL, but – if you have a great quarterback, that's half the battle in this league. So the fact that Cliff Kingsbury consistently finds those guys, I think that's a really good sign. And you're not going to have to worry about the defensive issues as much in the NFL because of the salary cap, because you have the same amount of talent in large part compared to other teams. So I think if you want a coach to do something extremely well, finding a good quarterback is a great place to start. I think I, just to piggyback off that, you made me think of uh, in college, um, he had a quarterback named Davis Webb at Texas Tech who uh, had a chance to play a little bit and then got hurt and uh, Mahomes supplanted him. And even I've talked to Davis Webb uh, when I was doing a story on Cliff Kingsbury when Cliff first showed up. And, you know, this is a guy who lost his job because he was hurt, had a transfer, and could have been bitter as hell. And, in fact, he is one of Cliff Kingsbury's biggest supporters. And here's a guy that couldn't keep the job at Texas Tech because of Mahomes, but Cliff had found him, got him there, and helped him get to Cal, where Davis Webb played so well in his one year at Cal that he was a third-round draft pick. And uh, so I, I think – finding the quarterback. I, I agree that he develops them. Like, don't get me wrong, but I do th agree with Kyle. Like he knows how to find them too. The guys that have that chance. Shout out to Davis Webb as a golden bear. Shout out to John Skelton for having a classic Mustang double ding right there. Just going to throw that out out there. By the way, I'm going to, Kyle made me think of something. So I'm going to put you guys on the spot, starting with you, Kyle. Is coaching going to be more or less important in this NFL preseason where there are no preseason games, meaning are the teams that excel in September going to be the teams that are have superior coaching or is this where talent 
is really going to shine through because talent will take over in the absence of preparation. I, I do think it's one sport where coaching is pretty pivotal and I think the roster composition helps a lot. Like the fact that the Cardinals have so much continuity is a big part of it, but I think a coach has to understand how much he can implement and how much he can't and being realistic with that stuff. And I think we are going to see in September some, uh, some, you know, guys not being on the same page and, and, and maybe some bad football at times. And I think a coach realizing where the limit is, is important. And yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the talent, is going to win out a lot of the time, but this is a game with 11 guys who have to work together. Um, so I think, I think coaching can be a big deal, especially early. What do you think, Darren? I, I think, I think it's going to be a combination again. I, I, when I, when I think about what this season's going to look like, it's tough for me. And I know I've said it a million times, you guys are probably tired of it, but I, I, I keep thinking of the beginning of the 2011 season and not having the off season stuff. Now, again, different scenario where as opposed to this year they weren't able to talk to coaches until training camp started in July but then when they did you still had a regular training camp with regular preseason games so there isn't an exact parallel but um, I just remember the again the offenses seem to be a little bit ahead you've mentioned the sloppy tackling I, I, I just feel like uh, I guess, I guess in the end, I don't know if I really know. I don't know to your question what is going to be more important. I don't know what is going to make the bigger difference because this just, just feels so different in so many ways. You know, are, are, are guys going to – are you going to lose some continuity in the little training camp you have if somebody tests positive? You know, you might, you might be in a position at some point where your games, once the regular season starts – don't get affected because you've managed to stamp out within your organization, uh, the COVID virus. But what happens if you lose uh, two weeks of DeAndre Hopkins right at the beginning of training camp? So he doesn't get a chance to work on what well, right at the beginning of padded practices, let's say. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, he's not, doesn't miss any games, but now he loses all that practice time or, or, and that's just an example. Like, there, there are so many variables that could happen in this particular training camp in this particular year. I'm really having a hard time putting my finger on what I'm expecting or what might make the biggest difference. Well, it was interesting to see NFL Network. Steve Weiss did a walk and talk, a little inside uh, feature with the Rams walking around their complex, what sort of accommodations they have made and, and how they've blown out other media rooms and turned those into locker rooms so everyone can socially distance. And then they got around to the equipment room and the equipment manager, and at least it was my first glance at some of the mouth guards. And so they had a couple of helmets, and there was one where you have the traditional visor, and then you have a separate piece that goes around the bottom portion of the face mask. And it's akin to a visor, except it sort of has a grid where your mouth would be, sort of like a Halloween mask, if you will, so you could breathe through that. Then there was another entire piece visor, the visor and the face mask, or the mouthpiece, all in one that applies within the face mask. So it was intriguing to see that. Uh, what they didn't explain, I don't know if you guys know, Kyle, is that optional or is that mandatory? Pretty sure it's optional, and I, I'd assume – these players are going to try it out in training camp. And I mean, if you, if it doesn't affect you too much, it's a great idea to use it because I think it would certainly help when you're in close quarters, but I know JJ Watt and maybe some other guys are wondering, is it going to restrict my breathing or make it super hot underneath my helmet? So that's a, a hurdle they have to clear, but certainly something worth a try to, to help curb coronavirus in a situation where you are having contact. It's funny because, I mean, let's face it, the argument for wearing masks, which I think everybody should be doing, and I feel like it is showing as more and more people are doing it, that it, it's, it's helping in the, in the overall uh, coronavirus fight, is the whole idea is that you're not helping yourself, you're helping others. And that's why people argue about the mask and whether they should wear it. And it, it's funny to hear it possibly being transferred into this situation. I mean, if, if a player is using it, in theory, a, a big reason, although in closer quarters, you know, obviously sweat could get in your mouth because of tackling. So it may be a little bit different, but in theory, are you wearing it on your helmet to protect others 
or to protect yourself, if you're wearing it to protect others, are you like these other people, these people that don't like to wear masks? Or you're like, well, I don't want to get hot. I don't really care. Tough tiddlywinks if I breathe on you. You know, it's, it's, it's funny to have these real life thoughts uh, kind of get integrated into the, the playing of the sport. You think it's bad when you see a brawl in Walmart, right? And there's, there's two customers brawling in the light bulb aisle at Walmart over you're not wearing a mask. Just wait or that's the cause of a big, big brawl in an NFL game because somebody isn't wearing a mask. And the other guy, I don't know. I, I, I wonder to what degree there's going to be that social pressure. Um, but forget that. We got enough to, to argue about right now when it comes to the top 100. So what do you think? Who, who has anything to complain about right now? Kyle, is, it, is Patrick Peterson complaining right now based on the top 100? Yeah, I mean, I, I know he had a suspension and a bad season. It all depends how you categorize the top 100. Is it based on 2019 and what he did? Then, yeah, he wasn't a top 100 player. Do you look at the aggregate of the last five years and, and factor that in? then he probably is a top 100 player. So I I can understand both sides of it. One thing I do appreciate is Buda Baker making it. I think he's been pretty under the radar for a while and he's starting to get um, his just due. His his motor is phenomenal. He's, you know, he's such a small guy and his ability to hold up in the box and get tackles for losses in addition to his coverage has been pretty impressive. So it feels like he's reached a new level of, maybe uh, fame at this point and, and respect from his peers. So I think that to me is the biggest standout is Buddha making it into the top 100. I guess for me, I, I mean, I don't really, I mean, I, I look at this again, this is players voting. I've been in the locker room when the, the ballots have gone around at the end of the season, half the guys are barely, barely paying attention. Some of them fill out about eight names and you're supposed to do 20. Uh, I, in fact, I think when Buddha, um, talked about uh, on his little clip uh, when he got named in when he was talking about and they made some joke about how he didn't even vote for himself he even said himself he only filled out one name he put Pat Mahomes at the top and left the rest like, so you got to take this with a grain of salt you know right. is is DK Metcalf I, I think DK Metcalf is a nice player I don't see how he would be ranked ahead of Kyler Murray right now in the NFL as better players but he was and uh, it was from a moment in time late last season, and that's how it went. And, you know, again, I, I try not to get too riled up about top 100. Uh, I, uh, as we record this, I'm feeling pretty confident Chandler Jones is going to be in there. Uh, and that's really – that's the most important thing so that we don't have to ask Chandler Jones all next season about how he got snubbed in the top 100. Yeah, Patrick Peterson, get ready. You know, if you want best practices on how to feel that question repeatedly <laughs> ad nauseum, then go over to Chandler's locker and ask him uh, about what's coming because Patrick Peterson – by the way, Fred Warner, Niners linebacker, nice player. I mean, yeah. a guy who just seemingly came out of nowhere last year, like, wow, where'd the Niners find this guy? But he's number 70? You know, I mean, Buddha's 97 as a pro bowler and about 8 million tackles last year, and then Fred Warner ends up at 70, to Darren's point about DK Metcalf. They're – Guys, we see a lot of in the division. You sort of go, wow, okay, there, there were some curious rankings on the guys we're familiar with. Put it that way. Hey, if, if Patrick can use being snubbed the same way Chandler did last year and, and have a career year, I'm sure the Cardinals will be happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the P2 effect with the, uh, the chip on the shoulder pad right now is, is, is the size of uh, Mount Humphreys. Put it that way. All right, so – uh, what else? What other clerical business stuff before we go? Pup list. We don't expect uh, anyone, Darren, on, or at least as of right now. We're, no, know. I don't think I don't think they're going to have anybody on the physically unable to perform list, which is a good I, good thing. I, I I try to think of some of the guys who were hurt at the end of last season. I mean, if Marcus Gilbert's being talked about as the starter or right tackle, you're you're certainly not going to have him on the pup list to start training camp. Uh, so I was already assuming he was going to be okay. And, and in terms of the other injuries, I mean, there were so many IR injuries last year that other than the Marcus Gilbert one felt like they moved guys there just because they weren't going to be back for the rest of the season, but it wasn't like a devastating type thing. So it's nice to know they'll be that healthy. Now all we got to do is pay attention to, uh, you know, the league did add a COVID-19 portion of the IR, which has a little different rules, but guys can land on there whether they test positive and we won't know because they're not allowed to talk about it 
if a guy ends up on the COVID-19 IR, uh, which keeps them out for, I don't know exactly how long at this point, it's either they tested positive or they were in contact with somebody that tested positive and, and they're now in the quarantine process trying to get cleared up from that. So um, that'll pop up. I'm sure guys will end up on there at some point, although it seems like a lot of rookies have ended up testing positive coming in and the Cardinals apparently haven't had anybody, at least as far as we know, they haven't put anybody on the list. So that's a good sign. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that they're going in a good direction right now and, and we'll kind of see how this plays out. Well, just to show how fluid it is, I, I looked at my notes from last week here on Cardinals Underground and I had the MLB dash encouraging signs. That's where we were a week ago with Major League Baseball. Look where we are now. So you just have no idea what's around the corner. So you're, are you saying you're optimistic that you'll be on the sideline for your 17th season or you're not optimistic? Right now, I'm more concerned if I'm going to get the clearance in the tier availability that goes with being a sideline guy because, uh, you know, the, we might have some friction here, Kyle, a little bit. If, uh, you know, Darren Urban's a certain tier and then <laughs> certain other ones of us are not a certain tier and thereby not cleared to be on the sideline, that's the question right now. Well, I feel like if you construct a bubble that you could kind of like walk in as you're going up and down, that'll be like the, the perfect solution where they're going to have to say yes. If you show that you're physically not touching anybody, you're not within six feet because you're in this humongous bubble, then that's a win-win for everybody. I there think. are those bubbles out there that you can kind of get into and, you know, yeah, run around. You can and walk. <laughs> And you know what? I can get even closer to the sideline without fear of getting, you know, dump trucked by someone. Yeah, so, yeah you know, if you get hit, you'll be fine. I start oh, be happy with the echo when you're talking, but. That's true. That would be right. Jim Almohundro wouldn't like that. But if he, yeah, I mean, you know, we're on these Zoom things as it is. I mean, you know, how much worse than the audio will get at, <laughs> at, at this point. As Darnell Dockett used to tell me, I look for guys like you to break my fall. <laughs> That's what Doc I, I, used to tell me. As long as he's honest. I mean, what do you, what like, do, you do? Yeah. So, you know, um, Although if it doesn't happen, Kyle, uh, me and you are going to file a grievance because maybe they're discriminating guys with facial hair. You know, yeah. that's what I want to know. That's, 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 that's the ace in the hole around here. Bad facial hair isn't allowed on the field. <laughs> <laughs> no, notice Kyle's, Kyle's distinguishing between me and him. There's facial no. hair and then I'm there's clumped, bad I'm facial clumped in, hair. I'm clumped in with you, buddy. No, no, I think a, the situation was bad. bad facial hair and the other one just has facial hair. <laughs> That'll do it for Cardinals Underground. Now I really am cheesed off. <laughs> <laughs>